The first lesson from the New Testament for this morning is found in Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, which can be found on page 193 of the New Testament in the Pew Bibles. Listen for the word of God. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness to the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The second lesson from the New Testament this morning is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, which can be found on page 135 of the New Testaments in the Pew Bibles. Listen for the word of God. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have done, come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of God, for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord, help us to understand the scripture in the context of the time it was written and also in the context of our time. Bless our hearts and our souls and our minds with understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's a blessing to be with you again this morning. Um, I want to thank Sheila and the choir. I don't think I've ever mentioned this to you before, but I, I, I just preach wherever God calls me to be, and today he's called me to be here. But a lot of the churches no longer have choirs. And some of them don't even have a piano player. And I don't think it's that they can't afford to pay somebody, they can't find anybody. So I just want you to know to be grateful for Sheila and your choir and show them a little appreciation once in a while. Don't let it go to their heads. Or well, a few years ago on my trip to the Holy Land, we found ourselves at the Garden Tomb which is believed by many to have been the burial place of Jesus. 
Now fortunately at the time, there weren't many visitors there besides us. And since our group was small, we managed to find a small shelter where we sat down to rest. Someone suggested that we sing in the garden. Now everyone knew all the words except me because I was used to playing it, not singing it. But when we finished, I looked around at our group and there wasn't anyone who didn't have tears in their eyes. The song was especially meaningful when we realized we might have been at the very spot where Mary first encountered the risen Christ. Now in Paul's time, there were many who did not believe in an afterlife at all. The Sadducees were in that group. They didn't believe in the bodily resurrection or any kind of life after this one. And that's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> oh my gosh, there's actually people who haven't heard that one before. <laughs> Others believed that resurrection was something that happened at baptism. When we emerged from the water, a new person, leaving the old sinful person behind. Then there were some who thought we were spiritual beings stuck in a physical body. So they actually were repulsed by the idea of a physical resurrection. The phrase resurrection of the dead literally means rising of the corpses. And the translation from the original Greek is not rise, but stand up. So it's corpses standing up. Now you can start to think it's a horror movie you're hearing about, not Holy Scripture. Now we don't know for sure what was happening in the church at Corinth in Paul's time. Perhaps some Christians were being tempted to return to their pagan origins. Maybe some were getting hung up on side issues of the Christian life, topics of discussions that were popular with philosophers and teachers of the day, topics that would be timely one day and forgotten about the next, sort of like today's news media. So Paul seemed to be reminding and clarifying to the followers of Jesus just what they as Christians believed and what the foundations of their faith were. Christ died for our sins. He was put to death and rose on the third day, all according to prophecy from Holy Scripture. This had to be part of their foundation or their faith would die. Now after the death of Jesus, his followers were afraid. Many of them went into hiding, fearful that they might meet the same fate as their leader. Due to that fear and the misunderstandings about what had happened, would the followers stay together and build up the church? Or would they splinter off into different factions, lose their focus, and have the life and death of Jesus become another forgotten chapter in history. To prevent this, Paul felt he needed to remind them of the foundations of their faith, especially of the fact that Jesus lives again. His enemies and all the evil of the world were defeated when he rose from the grave. What did they have to fear now? Paul reminds them of the appearances that Jesus made after his death. There were numerous ones during the 40 days between the resurrection and his ascension. So they weren't forced to rely on just one eyewitness. The followers of Jesus and all Christians since entered into a new relationship with God due to the resurrection of his son. Because of Christ, we know more about death but yet it is still in many ways remains a mystery to us. Ironically, death just seems to be the greatest mystery in all of life. For many, death is something to be feared, but for Christians, much of that fear should have been chased away by the resurrection of Jesus. Whenever someone died, my dad would always say, that's a journey we all have to take someday. None of us will know for sure just what the journey entails until that someday. Often the fear of death is actually the fear of the unknown. Due to advances in science, we have more and more people who have had near-death experiences. That gives us more insight into the mystery of death. But even there, we get disagreements. 
One person who had a near-death experience told me all she saw was blackness. Some experience what they consider to be hell, and some experience heaven. Now, I remember when I first read about the near-death experience, I was pretty young, and I've heard it said that no one dies alone. In the information I first read, those who died but returned reported when they crossed over, being with friends and relatives who had already passed. Supposedly, anyone who has crossed and returned to tell about it basically reports that everyone important to them who had already died was there waiting to greet them when they arrived. Well, at the time I first read this, I really didn't know any dead people, only some animals that I had loved and lost. So my first thought was there wouldn't be much of a welcoming committee for me if I died, <laughs> though I would be thrilled to see my pets again. And yes, I have no doubts that our animals will be with us in the next life. Now, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago that I thought about those things. But yet today, I know so many dead people, they would have to rent a hall if they all wanted to be there when I go to join them. Years ago, I was out of town on a work assignment, and I ended up working with a lady who was quite a bit older than me. She was a delightful person to be around, and we soon became friends. She was married and had children, and if I remember right, she didn't have any grandchildren yet. So after we'd been working together for a few weeks, she opened up to me about her private life and told me when she was very young, she had been engaged. But her fiance was killed in an accident shortly before they were to be married. Then a few years later, she met and married her present husband. After she shared this with me, her face grew very dark, and she said of her deceased fiancé, I can't even remember what he looked like. On one of my travels, I met a lady who had recently been widowed, and she was traveling with a dear friend who had been widowed several years earlier. We became friends as well, and I ended up visiting her home a couple of years later. In her living room, she showed me a painted portrait of her husband who had died from cancer. She then told me about another painting she had once seen. <clears throat> In this painting, the artist's rendition of heaven showed a celestial setting with all those who had made it to heaven depicted as points of light. And after describing the painting to me, she asked me, very distressed, if we are all just points of light in heaven, how will I ever find my husband when I get there? Now, I couldn't think that her question was too silly since scripture tells us on that first Easter morning, Mary didn't recognize the risen Christ at first, even though he was standing right in front of her. So what age will we be in heaven? I once heard a psychic say, everyone there is 30. But what if you are sick at 30, or in terrible shape at that time? Or what if you died before 30? You know, Jesus still had holes in his hands, his feet, and his side. Were these just there as proof to his disciples that it was really him? Wasn't he healed once he ascended to the Father? Is heaven just like a parallel earth? or is it more like being in the heavenly realms? Will we remember everyone and everything that ever happened to us? Will we recognize everyone we know? Will they find us, or will we have to look for them? The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus release Christians from the fear of death. We know that there is a life after this one, but we still don't know exactly what it will be like and perhaps we aren't meant to know that yet. First, we have the debate of whether there is a life after this one. If we agree that there is, we can't always agree on just what it is like, or even when it begins. Some believers in the afterlife believe at death, we immediately go to be with Jesus. Others believe that we are asleep until the day of the bodily resurrection. Even Paul refers to the dead as those who have fallen asleep. 
Then there are those, including some Christians, who believe that we live again because our souls get a new body to inhabit here on earth, hence reincarnation. Then in the last few years, I've heard numerous accounts of our resurrection being brought about by space aliens. And then there are those who are afraid to be cremated because if they are, there will be no body to resurrect when Jesus returns. Now if matter cannot be created or destroyed, there has to be something left to resurrect. But in the same way, our spiritual bodies should not be able to be created or destroyed either. So for all the answers Christ gave us about death, we are still left with a lot of questions. Some Christians believe that at death we go to be with God, period, and we stay there forever. Those who believe in the second coming expect Christ to resurrect all those who have died and then join them together with those of us who still remain on earth. Then there will be a thousand year reign of Jesus on earth when the world will be as God intended it to be before humankind fell into sin. A Jehovah Witness I once talked to said she knows she is a person of the earth and I feel the same way. By the way, that's probably about the only thing I did agree with her on, but. <laughs> now some accounts say that part of Christ's followers will go to be in the heavenly realms forever. Some of us will spend eternity on earth. And personally, I feel I will be called to stay on the earth. But I won't know that for sure until it happens. We don't know the details of what is awaiting us when life as we now know it ends. We don't even know if Christ will return in our lifetimes, so we won't even have to go through the experience of dying. But we do know that Christ defeated death for himself and for all believers. If you read on further past today's scripture passage, Paul states in verse 26 of chapter 15, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Jesus destroyed that enemy for himself and for those who believe in him. Though death remains a mystery to those of us who have not yet been visited by it, we have nothing to fear. Christ has gone ahead of us to prepare a place for us. As he tells us in John 14, beginning with verse two. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And Paul, later in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians states, Lo, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable nature must put on the imperishable, and this mortal nature must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. My wish for you is that this Easter season will find you sharing the joy of Christ's resurrection with fellow Christians but even more so with those who don't yet know that our Savior has defeated death. May we lead unbelievers to know the risen Christ as we know him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.